I'm Luke Ford with actor and singer and songwriter Rick Moses and uh, I've known Rick for several years. We last spoke in 2008, I believe. Mm -hmm. So you had a CD came out uh, in 2005, I believe, Evil and Dangerous Men, which, right. which I've listened to many times. Mm -hmm. And now you've got a show coming up in Van Nuys on, what's the date? What's the time? It's May 1st, um, 8 p.m. at the CAP Theater in Sherman Oaks there. Near on uh, Ventura near near Woodland. Okay, very good. And uh, who's going to be playing in the show with you? I'm very happy to have my regular guys that I worked with on Evil and Dangerous Men, um, Gary Denton and uh, Sinclair Lott, and my son Adam, uh, my 16-year-old son Adam, is going to play with me as a member of the band, um, in keyboards and uh, and guitar, and I'm very proud. So. I'm a proud father as well as a, a, a proud musician. And have you guys played together in public before? No, this is the first time. It's kind of a synergism that occurred as I watched uh, my son's develop in music, Adam being very much the, the leader of his, himself and his younger brothers. Mm -hmm. And uh, my oldest son, Ronson, also plays well. And I, I even uh, written some songs with my oldest son and uh, I'll be doing some of that material. And oh. what can I tell you? Um, and so we, what are some of the songs that you're going to be doing? Well, we're going to do some stuff from Evil and Dangerous Men, mm -hmm. um, and some stuff that's new, that has never been performed in public, and hasn't been recorded. And I think it's uh, on the mark for things that should be said and shared with the world at large. So. Are these all original compositions of your own? That's right. Uh, except for one of the tunes I'll be doing, I wrote with my oldest son, Rick. That's called Generation, for those of you that can check out the Evil and Dangerous Men right. album. And uh, the rest are uh, newer uh, compositions and uh, written by myself. How long have you been writing songs? Um, I started uh, seriously doing it um, probably around age... 18. Uh, I had it in mind to do it, but it didn't happen. And curiously enough, one of the things that, that uh, prompted this particular form performance at this time, uh, I had a friend that, that I met about that time. His name is Lonnie Stevens. He was a, a distinguished actor. He'd been an Obie Award winning uh, actor, which is the uh, Off-Broadway off Tony Award. And uh, and he, he and I started writing songs together back then, and, uh, and did a lot of that uh, over the years, uh, including some material that I did for 20th Century Fox Records. And it, curiously, he owns the CAP Theater, oh. he and his partner Alex, and uh, I recently saw him uh, ran into each other and he invited me to play, and there was some young internet guys that were saying, uh, you know, you get more traffic than average for, for most people. Uh, Maybe it's, can we help you promote something? And so the synergist of that said, okay, let's do this. And not to mention the fact that it, it seemed my son Adam is well on track to being, uh, of, well, he certainly is professional level already. And it looks like that might be a career thing. So I have the, you know, it's one of the 613, actually, it's not technically a, one of the 613 mitzvahs, but it is a Judaic principle that a person should teach his. Uh, sons, uh, a, tra a trade. Right. And uh, so I'm blessed that that's one of the things that, that has occurred and I had a, a part in that. And so let's share it with the world. And uh, I think that's, uh, that's the goal. How many children do you have? Uh, six, Blanna. Wow. Yeah. Very good. And what are some of the themes that you've been writing about in your music the last few years? Well, Life, um, but I, that's always been the theme, you know, and it's been plenty big. So it's been a, uh, since I started writing songs, that's been the subject, and um, it remains it. Uh, curiously, uh, children make a person broaden out. Mm -hmm. I uh, uh, there was a uh, my oldest son referred to the song Generation, for example. My, I didn't have a title for it, it was some piece of music that I thought was intriguing and, and uh, so we worked on the music together and then he said, Dad, for a lyric, just make sure it's not a love song. You know, I said, okay. So it, it promotes uh, 
thought, what an interesting gauntlet to set down with mm -hmm. some cool music, you know. Mm -hmm. Because I'm not somebody who thinks that everything has to be social commentary. Love is a, is a good topic, right. and the dynamic between men and women certainly drives the world. So, But to deliberately go other places is also interesting and, uh, and important. And, of course, a lot of songwriters have been doing that quite well. So, but I think my particular take is, uh, how can I say it, well, worth listening to, hopefully. Are you, are you optimistic or pessimistic about America? That's a really interesting question. I think that everything's going, that most of what's going on is awful, but I remain optimistic that good is possible. Uh, are we talking to a, a largely Jewish audience? Cause, or, yeah, I, I, I'm not sure. No, I, no. I, okay. The reason I'm asking yeah. because of our mutual right. interest in Judaism. Um, I think that America's strength has been that it's been a God-based society. Yeah. And it was, it's undeniable, and anybody who says otherwise simply doesn't know history. Yeah. So in that regards, I think we're, it's about 50-50, it's a little disturbing. I think it was probably as we were young people growing up, it was about 60-40, and something like that. And now it's 50-50, somewhere around there. And, uh, and the media being mostly uh, on the non-God side of right. things. I think uh, that's what's disturbing, but the media isn't the people, and so there's still a strong base of God-fearing people, so in that sense I still think all the good, if you will, God-based means uh, Ten Commandment-based morality, mm -hmm. and, uh, and a society built upon that consciously, that that is the societal goal. Uh, I think that's what brought us this far. Uh, if, if America turns away from that, as many countries in the world have, uh, you know, it's going to go the way of, uh, of uh, Rome, if you will. How do how do people in the entertainment industry relate to your Orthodox Judaism? Well, happily, I've been uh, just trying to deal, uh, play the cards that God gives me, and uh, and that's been with the children themselves, and my mm -hmm. wife, the family life, uh, the challenges of putting food on the table, and like everybody else has to face. And I, uh, uh, I the people in the industry, I, I don't really think about it too much. Uh, although uh, I'm blessed that I think a lot of people like me personally mm -hmm. when, they, when we talk. Uh, I'd think they probably hate my politics and, and, and hate the idea of, uh, of pushing a, a God-based, morality-based society. Having said that, the title of my album, Even Evil and Dangerous Men, it's not to suggest that God-based uh, morality is a wussy thing. It's quite the opposite. The, the dangerous men that I refer to are the people who are uh, God-fearing uh, that uh, mean it. And they are generally more effective at fighting evil. And that's kind of what... Uh, the people who attach themselves to that don't like. I'm not saying that all liberals actually uh, fall in that category. But um, I'm getting off. Sort of wandering a bit. Help me uh, get back on. Point. Well, I'll, I'll say I met you in 2008. Mm -hmm. And a few minutes before I sat down at the restaurant where Mm -hmm. I met you. I was having lunch with Evan Syed, who's oh, yeah. a right-wing comic. Uh -huh. And I'd just come from the local branch of the LA Public Library where I'd read an essay on the role of the beard in Judaism. Mm -hmm. And I was clean-shaven when I met you. Mm -hmm. And I read this essay, and I met you, mm -hmm. and I talked to you, and I didn't shave for the next three and a half years. Wow. Oh. I, so I, I had a beard. I didn't cut it. Uh -huh. I had a beard down to here. Wow. And then I was... I was training to become a teacher of Alexander Technique, and it's like a three-year program, about $25,000 total tuition, and I was also moving, and I had to like come down, come up with the uh, first and last month rent deposit, mm -hmm. and my family hated my beer, mm -hmm. hated it, so I sold it to my, to my mother, my stepmother, so she gave me, I was $444 short of my tuition, mm -hmm. and I also needed to borrow a thousand for 
this my new apartment to you know first and last month rent. So I sold it to her, and and the deal was that I'd stay clean shaven for a year. Okay. So this was eighteen months ago. Uh huh. So when about three or four months ago I stopped shaving, and I started growing it back, and my family. I, I Skyped with my sister about two weeks ago, mm -hmm. and uh, she saw the beard coming back, and she was like appalled, and told my stepmother, and my stepmother said, oh, you got such a nice face, why do you want to cover up your face again with a beard? I said, well, I like it, but I'm always open to bribes. She, she said, I'll give you $500 if you keep it clean shaven for a year, and so I said, sold, and so I'm just waiting for the check. <laughs> Okay. So well, there's, <laughs> there's a lot of integrity there, yeah. but... <laughs> uh, I don't... I, I think you did the right thing, frankly. Uh, the, 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 because actually, the general principle, I, I think uh, not many people know, it's just, it's very broad and it's traditional and, yeah. and there's some Kabbalistic ideas underlying it, yeah. but it's, it's with a, a light hand, the concept, yeah. and it's meant that in general, if you can, yeah. and it doesn't bother particularly your wife or yeah. your close family yeah. members, yeah. then it's kind of good, it brings yeah. more chesed yeah. to the world, chesed, yeah. Yeah. mercy, yeah. so it's a little aspect of, of giving yeah. that, that uh, on a spiritual level that is somewhat effortless and automatic for those of yeah. us that, that let it happen. But it's a very small thing, and it's not doesn't exempt you from the Ten Commandments and right. human kindness and dignity, and just making close, uh, close people who are close to us happy. Yeah. So in that sense, you did a mitzvah, they say, a, a, yeah. you know, to yeah. to please your, your yeah, stepmother. Yeah, please my please my stepmother, and yeah. I got a badly needed some badly needed uh, money. I'm all, I'm all for it. <laughs> yeah, it's very light. I mean, you know. But um, at the same time, when I when I met you. And I, I read that essay by Mayor Soloveitchik, who's actually a clean-shaven, modern Orthodox rabbi, but he laid out in the essay the reasons for why Judaism generally holds with, with growing a beard. Uh -huh. and, and largely it's about accepting who you are mm -hmm. and, and allowing the natural differences between men and women Very good. and between adults and children. Exactly. And so the same time I read that and I met you, I stopped using Grecian formula. Uh -huh. My hair started turning gray when I was 27. Wow. So from about 27 until I met you, so that was five years ago, uh, so I was 41. So from 27 to 41, I was using a Christian formula uh -huh. to try to stay young. All right. Well, and then I met you, and, and something about meeting you and reading that essay, I stopped using the Christian formula, and I stopped, sha I stopped shaving, and I just said, I'm, I'm now 41 years old, I'm going to be who I am. I'm not going to try to look... Yeah, I'm just going to be who I am. And it was like, uh, it was very meaningful to me. Like a lot of people around me, you know, they weren't so thrilled, this or that. But uh, I found a lot of interesting reactions to the beard. I found a lot of people had strong reactions negative to it. It was like it challenged them. And yes, yeah, particularly but, in modern but, Orthodox Judaism, they you, kind of you, resented it. You defined it, though. The issue is is really the beard itself isn't what's important. It's the fundamental internal acceptance yeah. of. Well, there's this beautiful uh, uh, liturgical prayer that's in the Sephardic Siddur. I think it's for the second day of Rosh Hashanah, and a part of it says, um, uh, "Sharpen your mind and consider mm -hmm. who you are, mm -hmm. and what you are, mm -hmm. and where do you come from." Where are you going, and what power animates you, and to what purpose? Now, first of all, that's beautiful. Mm -hmm. but, but secondarily, the underlying thought is very much what you're talking mm -hmm. about, and that's all that the Torah is mm -hmm. saying. This is not just true for men; it's true mm -hmm. for women as well. Mm -hmm. There is a difference. Who, who mm -hmm. are you? What, your, what did God make you? Mm -hmm. And so I'll, I'll be that, uh, that with uh, a certain. Uh, hopefully a sort of level of gratitude mm -hmm. for the fact that we're have the privilege of life. And, and, and accepting the differences that yeah. come with, with age and the differences between men and women. Like, right. I stopped yeah. trying to be a pretty boy. Mm -hmm. The day I met you, I yeah. stopped trying to be a pretty boy. And I also stopped sleeping around. Oh, cool. Well, uh, so they kind of all ran together because, like, you can take your yarmulke off. Yeah. That's pretty easy, but it's yeah. really hard to take the beard off. Right. <laughs> you know, I dig it. That's more permanent. Yeah. And so whether I liked it or not, the beard was saying something to the wider world. Now, whether or not I was always behind it, you know, 100%, it 
it was like I'd made an, an irrevocable commitment short of cutting the thing off. Like, there was, it, it changed me, like it affected people. People were intimidated or provoked often. Uh, I found modern Orthodox Jews in particular were, were provoked and they kept saying, well, you know, it's not halakhically required. And I right. said, there's a big difference between halakhically required and what's the general Jewish thing? Exactly. Like the Torah has two commandments against cutting the beard. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And so obviously this is the preferred way to go. Uh, you know, there are exceptions if you need to, you know, cut a shave for your profession sure. or whatever. Exactly. Your wife uh, shan't buy a piece in the home. Yeah. But don't tell me that this is not the Jewish thing to do. Of course, it's obvious. You, you just look at how do you know certain commandments go beyond the, the question of, of the writings and the halakha. It's just like, what do we all know Jews have always been? Right. The, right. the traditional Jewish thing is being yeah. a beer. That's right. And to cut it off has traditionally mean you're trying to blend in with the wider society exactly. and have less tension with the wider society Therefore, to try to pass the, as, as everyone else. Therefore, don't do it unless you're getting paid. <laughs> <laughs> and that's cool. It really yeah. is cool. Yeah. I mean, it really is cool spiritually. Yeah. Because who, anybody wants to make fun that money doesn't matter mm -hmm. in this world. Right. I mean, they're not paying attention. Yeah. Uh, and that's another thing that somebody, uh, what kind of a the general thesis of spirituality that people misunderstand. They think it means I don't care about money, I don't care right. about the world. Right. Right. And as you know, that even just by simple Jewish tradition, mm -hmm. the three thing that, things that God uh, reserves for himself, if I recall, he doesn't delegate it to angels, are life and death and, and rain. And rain in the traditional uh, symbolic meaning means parnasa, mm -hmm. or livelihood, mm -hmm. it means money. Mm -hmm. God is intimately involved in this matter mm -hmm. and how we deal with it whether we have a lot of it or a little bit, is it one of the things that God sets for us to deal with as a, individuals. You know? So it's a big deal. But uh, I mean, the traditions uh, have, mm -hmm. have deep meaning. But it's mostly important, not the, the exterior. I mean, uh, mm -hmm. uh, it's the, uh, how can I say it? It's how you internalize it, and then it doesn't really matter what you look like. Again, the, well, I, I, I challenge off. you there. I think the exterior is very important. I oh, think yeah. it's as important as... I'm not sure if it's as... But it's very important. Like in Judaism, there are a lot of laws about how you dress. Yeah. And, and how and about the exterior, because the exterior affects the interior. Absolutely. Yeah. Like, like Christianity is more, you know, it's all about the heart. But in Judaism, like we wrap on tefillin mm -hmm. every morning. We do a lot of things that are external because what's going on externally profoundly affects you and I found having a beard profoundly affected me perhaps more importantly it profoundly affected the world around me it like it changed molecules in the air mm -hmm. you know when I walked into a secular environment and I had a beard it affected the atmosphere much more profoundly than if I walked in clean shaven still with the yarmulke mm -hmm. but with the beard it said, I'm serious about being Jewish. I think you're right. And so, I, 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 there's no argument. We're in agreement. I'm yeah, just yeah. talking about both yeah. sides of the same yeah. coin. You know. uh, how did, when did you start growing yours? Um, I, when I first, I, I think I had started to grow a beard for a, a certain project that I was doing years ago. And uh, so it overlapped, and, and I was... Um, it overlapped uh, my uh, conversion to Judaism. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So that really wasn't an issue. But I, in the meantime, before I got, as I got progressively more and more serious about Judaism, I, there were a number of reasons that I shaved it for this, that, and the other. Yeah. Shave it yeah. meaning not with a razor, but yeah. you know, cut yeah. it. And, um, and eventually, each time I, I did have a sense that uh, I stopped cutting it after a while because I had a sense, although I said, this is very good, I should do it, so-and-so wants it, or this is a good reason, or it's getting in the way, and now it's time mm -hmm. to change. But each time I, afterwards, instead of, I had like five minutes of thinking, oh, that's nice, and then afterwards there was a, definitely a sense of regret, and it was mm -hmm. something spiritual, mm -hmm. something there, that it wasn't quite, and I saw a look of disappointment on people's, uh, Mm -hmm. Especially in the eyes of older Jews, yeah. you know, even though they themselves didn't yeah. have beards, yeah. they were like, uh, yeah. you know, uh, what they say in uh, older Moroccans, they'd say things like, uh, uh, 
qu'est-ce qui se passe, qu'est-ce que vous avez fait avec ce beau barbe, you know, things like that, showing off a little bit in the French. Yeah, it, it, uh, it affected, also affected for me where I went to synagogue, because in Chabad they really, they love beards. Yeah, yeah. So I started going to more, mm. more often to Chabad shuls, rather than the modern orthodox shuls where they resented my beard. Yeah. But it isn't, uh, it's a, the sense of loss, although I realize we do have a part to play, and we do affect mm -hmm. others around us. Mm -hmm. And so, okay, let's step up, this is clearly mm -hmm. what God is showing me in a personal way, mm -hmm. this, these feelings that you're having, yeah. that's like the way God will talk to us yeah. a lot of the times. If it matches the, uh, the Torah, we can mm -hmm. be confident in that. It's a Sod Hashem Liriyah, the, the secret of God is to those who fear Him. Um, bottom line is we can become closer to God by paying attention to our sensibilities in these matters. But what I was uh, going to say is that, what was I going to say? We're talking about beers. <laughs> Lots of the thread. You're, you're when did you? Yeah. Oh, you know, you asked me. You yeah. asked me about um, when I saw. I shaved it a few times, but I probably mm -hmm. haven't shaved, uh, cut it in uh, several years, five, six years now. You know, mm -hmm. I haven't cut it at all. Um, so that's where it. Uh, when did you feel in your life that you'd become a man? Well, that's an interesting question. I, I'm. Uh, I think I've been pretty lucky in that regard. That. Uh, I was a father at age 24, yeah. and that was younger, although that shouldn't be uh, unusual in society the way it's always been throughout history. I, it was mm -hmm. unusual for my particular generation yeah. at that time. And uh, I think that was just a, a waking, uh, an awakening in general. Uh, one realizes, uh, so certainly from that time, uh, you know, it kind of depends on, th there's somewhat, we realize retrospectively it was a juvenile way of looking at manhood, mm -hmm. and then, but uh, at, there were times where I thought I was a man, you know, certainly from 16 on, mm -hmm. um, and thought of myself that way, but still realizing now that was a young man's take on it, uh, and uh, not, not, not particularly mature, but I'd say the mature take, you know, came when I became, when I became a father mm -hmm. for the first time. Yeah. So. Uh, but you have, not all of us are blessed with children. Yeah, You're I don't have children, man. and I'm, I'm looking never, at you from the outside. But so. I think it was when I yeah. when I met you, and I stopped I stopped dyeing my hair with Grecian formula, oh. and I I accepted going gray, and I accepted growing a beard. Oh, cool. I I'm I, I'm something happened. That's and cool. It was I mean, like that. accepting who I am and not trying to. Be the pretty boy. Well, it's very touching that you share that with me as well, or that I can, can be a part of some something like that is very, very gratifying. And yes, I did hope that that would happen, mm -hmm. that somehow I would affect some people that yeah. way. But I didn't know it would happen. Mm -hmm. you know, I just said, I have to do what I have to do. And that's what you've done. And now you're affecting others. Yeah. And this is what we're all a part of. This yeah. goes back from the days of the, the Torah, Mount yeah. Sinai, you know, accepting how God made us. That's what we're here for. How did it affect you having daughters? Well, I didn't have daughters. Oh, I, I, have, okay. I have all six sons. Six okay. sons, thank God. Mm -hmm. However, I do have uh, granddaughters. Oh, okay. And that's a trip. Mm -hmm. I remember <laughs> saying uh, years ago, I there was a 31 Flavors ice cream that used to be near a house I had in Studio City. And my kids were very small. And a, a little group of, uh, you know, six to eight-year-old girls came in as part of a mm -hmm. school event. And I remember it, I couldn't have been more surprised as I thought about them as being a father of children the same age, mm -hmm. boys. I said, you know, if a group of, of Martians had come in, you know, that were talking, I, I couldn't have been more surprised as I contemplated yeah. the essence of what is, yeah. a young, what is a young girl. And uh, created by God, half of mankind, if you will, the, yeah. the Adam and Eve that makes it uh, from which mankind comes. This female aspect is uh, absolutely equal part of humanity. And uh, so, in any case, but since I had a, a lot of years between that age when my sons were, my oldest boys were uh, six and eight, um, to, uh, and then having granddaughters, I, I got over that. I got better, let's put it that way, a little better. I have maybe, a smattering of understanding of, 
uh, the female nature that I didn't have at that time. How about getting married? How did that affect you? Well, that's what, you know, you're really going to the, 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 the head-on issues that uh, I really do want to talk about, and I'm, uh, I, we'll, we'll, go come back, we'll come back to that for a moment, but that is essentially the body of work that God uh, gave me that I'm performing with my son. On, uh, it's, those are the main issues that we're facing. So, I, if you will, God bless me to write a lot about these things. Yeah. Um, but I wanted the songs to speak for themselves. Yeah. But still, they'll do what they do. But so, but go back to the question. I'll try to juggle with it without the song. Yeah. How, how 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 do how is getting married affected you? Well, it's awesomely um, um, shoo. I have uh, all of my children through mm -hmm. my, the, but two two wives. Mm -hmm. I should mention that the. The mother of my oldest son, uh, we were divorced, uh, you know, 20 years ago, more than that, and uh, I'm sorry, 30 years ago. But but she passed away recently, mm. and um, God rest her soul. And uh, and so that my younger sons and who became my oldest son's stepmother, we've been married for uh, 24 years or something like that. Yeah. And uh, so tremendously, and in fact, I became more interested in raising children and the dynamic of family life it the, you know the challenges set before us are mirrored in that structure over and over and over again like yeah. uh, barbershop mirrors you know have a mirror on this yeah. wall a mirror yeah. on that wall yeah. and you see yeah. the windows going out like that yeah. um, so um, uh, this is what we face and by the way it's uh, it's a huge challenge. I, I don't think there's anything any harder. Um, my background uh, as an athlete, my background in martial arts, my background as an artist, probably none of that is as hard. And, uh, and I think a lot of soldiers will tell you that they, don't, they find the battlefield a piece of cake compared mm -hmm. to uh, Right. You know, to uh, what it takes to maintain a marriage, to deal with family life. Having said that, it's also the deepest and most gratifying thing that a person can do. So it's the hardest and the most rewarding yeah. at the same time. But uh, I don't think people should forget that it's hard. Yeah. And that's part of the, the who's dealing the cards here, you know? Uh, and uh, do we going to walk away from the table since there's. Uh, this is the gauntlet set before us. Well, the first commandment of the Torah is what? Be fruitful and multiply. It's not our choice whether we can do that. Right. But to keep it in mind as a direction is important. So, how do you how how is Judaism wearing on you? It's it's a religion with a lot of demands and a, and a lot of rituals, and it's and it's easy to just get into a state where you're just going through the motions. How does Judaism wear on you? You've been, you've been Jewish for, for a long time now. Yeah. A couple uh, of decades. Well, Judaism itself, I mean, real Judaism is, uh, is like a lifesaver. It's like it makes sense out of the world where there's otherwise no sense. Mm -hmm. um, having said that, it doesn't mean that I'm, I'm enamored of uh, the Orthodox, uh, the way it's done at the yeshiva world, I have mm -hmm. a lot of bones to pick mm -hmm. with things that are taught that are not actually part of Judaism. Uh, there are manifestations there that exist, uh, but in the same sense that there are, there's crime and violence and immorality that exist that is not uh, what God wishes for us, but we know that it exists. Mm -hmm. Um, and there are falsehoods that people say in the name of God. I'm, I'm a big believer that's essentially the, the meaning of the, this, uh, you know, not to take the Lord's name in vain, is not to promote falsehood in the name of God. Uh, now, for those who aren't doing it on purpose, they certainly are going to get a pass from God, um, to a certain extent, if it was beyond their intellect to grasp anything else. But if they have a sharp mind, uh, then they won't be getting that pass. And uh, so, can you give any specifics? 
I probably could, but I don't, I don't want to drop drop the bigger question that you asked. Yeah, how is um, Judaism wearing? Yeah, it's wearing uh, beautifully on me, and I'm I'm very grateful to have something enduring that has lasted, uh, and that that I'm certain uh, is God what God wants for mankind to share it with my sons and watch them prosper and grow, and even my older sons, I, I see them uh, taking the very best, which is what they should take, and running with it and doing great in life. And I wish that for everybody. Uh, on the big picture, there is a tendency, but it's not unique. Uh, the, the Talmud talks extensively about uh, Jews that uh, have gone through the motions and what happens with empty rituals, and the mm -hmm. prophets have, mm -hmm. uh, have language that's ex uh, very extensive on the subject of, uh, you know, what are these offerings that you're giving me? What I want is uh, God is saying, the, the prophet is saying, in the voice of God, um, what? It's not these offerings that I want. It's not these sacrifices. What I want is your heart. You know? And uh, the Talmud uh, discusses the uh, the deficiencies of people. Uh, well, uh, that have what's called Torah of the mouth rather than Torah of the heart. Yeah. And in fact, some of the uh, the greatest. Uh, Torah scholars of their generations have uh, done much harm uh, to the Jews, arguably more harm than any of their external enemies. But the sages of Israel tell us this. And for those who are interested in this sort of thing, uh, I refer to the Masket Sanhedrin, and which one has the Mishnah of the four commoners and three kings who have no place in the world to come. And referring to the to the commoners in particular, in the case of Doeg, in the case of Ahitophel, in the case of Yerovam, they were the greatest scholars of their generation, and two of them were the heads of the Sanhedrin. And yet, in the case of Doeg, he became literally a mass murderer. In the case of the, uh, the killing and being the instrument of the the murder of the the, the Kohanim of Nov. And in the case of Doeg, uh, promulgating this outrageous immorality in the hopes that they're... Uh, uh, tell me how much I should fill in for, say, say, for you and me or for the, for, the, for the audience. But I'm just saying that there have been, uh, and, and as far as the, uh, the history, um, Yeravam, who virtually destroyed uh, ten of the twelve tribes, um, uh, on a symbolic level, certainly, uh, I mean, you know, is, is the, what the history that followed was the destruction of, the, of ten of the twelve tribes, and that's in which he, the greatest scholar, after his mentor Shlomo Hamelech, King Solomon, um, uh, he set up golden calves and idol worship and uh, yeah, on a massive scale, forbid people to go to the, the holy temple. All in the name of, he was a Torah scholar, mm -hmm. in the name of, I can do this and that and convince the rest of you guys that it's all according to law. So, uh, this is not, I'm not sharing anything that isn't right there for anyone to read. Uh, but not, a lot of people won't even touch that, the yeshiva world, and vastly. You know, what are you concerned about world. specifically in the yeshiva world? Only the that uh, if people uh, uh, put an emphasis uh, on ritual over, I'll be simple for the, uh, if anyone thinks that there's any rabbinical law that supersedes the Ten Commandments, uh, that person is either an ignoramus uh, or a rasha. Okay, so uh, there is a, t a huge tendency for people to, in the yeshiva world, to even to argue that point. And uh, so, without getting into the particulars of it, that's the big picture. It's the gauntlet I throw down. You think, um, it, they, the Torah, the sages of Israel have always warned against that. And uh, so, the knowledge I have is because of what we call Hazal, the sages of Israel, what's in the Talmud, if you will. They're the ones who claim it. I'm simply saying that it shouldn't be ignored. And if it is ignored, the consequences are devastating you know, for individuals. But the, the Ten Commandments and the, and the five books of Moses, they, they've been interpreted and 
and we we have the sages of, of each generation who who guide us in the way we should be observing the Torah in in our present circumstance. Do you do you uh, disagree with that or? Uh, yeah, yeah. Well, I'll tell you. Let me give let me give you the, an example. The the uh, the last Mishnah of Masaket Sanhedrin, since that came up, states that if a person is not completely knowledgeable with five books of Moses and all of Scripture and all of Talmud, they're not. And this is quoting them directly. Not a fit member of society. Now, today's world. I think that's a fair statement if you mean fit member of society uh, that uh, whoever de who are the leaders of a given people. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. There are people who are referred to as Gedolim today yeah, who right. will openly admit, no, they're referred to by others as mm -hmm. Gedolim, but, and those people will admit that they know nothing, almost nothing of scripture. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and so by definition they're not qualified to be leaders as the traditional definition goes. So if you mean by what you said is that there is the, the Torah commandment that there were, we will follow those of our generation mm -hmm. who are knowledgeable, right. that's obviously in the book of Devarim and it's specifically part of the five books of Moses. So I'm 100% behind that. Yeah. But those who claim it, it's not quite the same thing as those who claim to have it and those who are it. And so that's, that's what I'm... And there's very little Bible study in, in yeshiva, it's Talmud study. Uh, no, so indeed, they, indeed. And so the problem is, is the, uh, what is the, uh, there's a Talmudic principle, and uh, that uh, it, for people who will read it with, uh, simply to understand what's there, referred to as a lion crouches upon it, which mm -hmm. is the phrase the sages use whenever uh, rabbinical law seems to thwart, is in opposition to the five books of Moses. In that case, they 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 summarily dismiss it uh, as a well, a lion crouches upon it. it. Means obviously we can't go there mm -hmm. because that's the Torah. It's going against the Torah. So that's not our intention. And by the way, I'm not at all uh, someone who's against rabbinic law. I I study it. I do it every day. I do right. it with my children. I recommend people study the Talmud. There's nothing but wisdom and goodness there. Mm -hmm. But you have to admit what it what is there and what's not there. Yeah. And clearly, the um, the Talmud's position is that you don't let rabbinical law thwart the written commandment. Now, it's, is it a beautiful case? Is there sometimes deep thought that, uh, absolutely, and some brilliant thought that uh, enriches a person's life in understanding the various dimensions that are implicit in the five books of Moses, uh, of commandments that are there? Absolutely. Uh, but it, you still don't throw the baby out with the bathwater. It's as simple as that. There's sometimes you can contemplate something, it'd be better for having contemplated, without actually saying, well, therefore that means I can steal, or therefore I could commit adultery, you know, God forbid, all these things, I could commit murder. You know, I, am I making myself uh, mm -hmm. clear yeah. on you yeah. know, where I'm coming from? So one has to be careful. Now, um, so, where are we at? Okay, so I'm going to take it in a, in a different direction, but. Okay. Uh, my life the past year has been profoundly affected by my observance of one particular law which I've struggled with over the, over the years, but uh -huh. it's almost never discussed publicly in Jewish life, but mm -hmm. I completely cut masturbation out of my life about a year ago, and I've just found it life-changing. Well, I think that's, first of all, it's a written commandment. It is. You know, to thou shalt not yeah. spill seed. So right. therefore, you're getting wh whatever strength you've mm -hmm. gained right. is a midah connected midah, a, a yeah. direct result yeah. of your taking a, a commandment of God and making it a reality in your mm -hmm. life, yeah. and therefore you become a better person. Yeah. There's no question. Yeah, I found it life changing. Yeah. So, it's like it gives me a strength and a clarity, and I don't get distracted by it. <laughs> the fantasies and sure. that, that I used to get distracted yeah. on, and yeah. just like completely cutting that out of my life, starting every day with a cold shower, yeah. and <clears throat> it like it builds up a strength because I've like I've taken care of the most difficult part of my day in mm -hmm. the first five minutes, cool. that cold shower, Beautiful. and then then cut out cut out the masturbation, and every Orthodox Jewish bachelor that I know well, that I know really well, mm -hmm. is a porn addict. Oh my God! <laughs> Everyone that I know well, okay. and I asked this one one friend of mine who didn't get married till he was about forty, and yeah. orthodox guy, 
And, and I asked him, well, what's, what's marriage like? And he said, it, it's really tough, man. My wife won't let me watch porn. Uh -huh. And they got divorced a few months later. Uh, so wow. this kind of... Uh, well, how could if someone call themselves an Orthodox observant Jew where that would be even an issue, except that there is a, a yesh, well, I call it a yeshivish world, it's not limited to that, but it, it, it seems to come from a, a world in which people study Talmud. They're told that they're tzaddikim because they're engaged in this process, mm -hmm. and virtually every other thing that is a, a really primordial as far as God is concerned, in His commandments, mm -hmm. is ignored. And, mm -hmm. and so there's a lot of that. Uh, mm -hmm. That is my understanding. It's what I see. Um, so, but it isn't. Uh, I mean, very simple. That's why it's best for people to be married. And, yeah, and, get, and particularly for men, because yeah. when men aren't married, and I'm saying this is men who's mm -hmm. never been married, but I'll say it: mm -hmm. men who aren't married generally tend to be a menace to society and to themselves. Yes, yeah, I know you said that to me years ago when we yeah. talked. I admired you for being so self-aware and. Uh, the fact that you were would help you to control yourself, and, and so that's why you're. And there's like this, this, there's this particular predatory energy around the, the uh -huh. entertainment industry that I yeah. that I picked up on. When I first moved to LA in 1994, and for me it was thrilling. It was just like thrilling yeah. sexual energy, but it's just so raw and predatory in, uh -huh. in Hollywood. It's out there in all other industries, but it's more raw, more obvious, more base. Yeah more predatory. You just see, it's, it's just like, uh, you know, jackals and their prey. That's, that's what I see so raw in, in the entertainment industry. Yeah, well, that's, uh, that's where I grew up. Yeah. So I, I know it very well. I recognize it in the same terms that you're talking about. Mm -hmm. And I think it is a fact of life everywhere. It's not like it's limited to, uh, to the uh, Hollywood industry. Right. And actually, though, what sense does it all make? What's the point of all this? Because all of these things that exist as obvious realities of life, who put them there? Well, God made right. the universe this way. Right. And, uh, and so what are we supposed to do about it? And that's why the, the principle of, of um, you know, the, God created the, the cure before the disease. You know, mm -hmm. he made man from uh, the Torah as the uh, rabbinical tradition goes. And there's wisdom in that, and understanding, obviously, historically speaking, the physical Torah, isn't, what we have on Torah scrolls, isn't there until after there's man. Yeah. But you, you're talking about an underlying principle that gives thought. God, what must God have been doing? The bottom line is one finds an answer only in these things. You're really stuck in, in the Torah. You're stuck with, and for, the, for those who aren't Jewish, I don't mean uh, it's simply the five books of Moses as a basis for studying their Christianity or any other religion they're interested in. If they're looking at it as being a holy book, they will find answers that otherwise don't exist. They won't like all the answers mm -hmm. they find, and they'll find that uh, God is a tough taskmaster, but not too tough, not too tough that we can't cut it. Yeah. Just, tough, tough enough to make it ch the challenge that he alone decided it would be. But uh, this is really interesting to have this kind of a conversation on. Uh, yeah, it's not your everyday. It's not, it's not your everyday, everyday kind of every kind of stuff. Not even in Orthodox Jewish life that yeah. we talk about these things. In general, what what is good about Orthodox Judaism is you'd have to say that you, you in general you see people having big families and you yeah. see somewhat of a reduction in the level of divorce. Yeah. Uh, it's not perfect, and there there and there's ways in which people become. Uh, materialistic in a way that God did not intend, and, and sexual in ways in which God, God does not intend. Uh, but mostly, it's, it's good, and, it, and it's true, obviously, for Christians. The religious, you can see the benefits of their the, the, the relative benefit. Christians and anybody who decide to say, "I'm going to live," I believe in these type of commandments. That there are, in fact, commandments from God, and that's the reason to live that way. Because otherwise, why wouldn't one just do whatever they could yeah. do? And uh, there has to be, and anybody who's tried, you know the story of Eliyahu Hanavi, who, who sets the challenge for the Jewish people when he, uh, he against the priest of Baal, who's, uh, and he says, I'll slaughter a calf, uh, a cow, and you slaughter a yeah. cow, and we'll see whose God mm -hmm. lights the, the altar. 
And so they stage a fake one, and it won't light. In fact, their attempt to light, light it leads in disaster. And of course, fire from the sky, boom. But before that happens, he says to the Jews, you Jews who are a little bit with Hashem, and right. a little bit with Baal, right. you should either go all the way with God, right. or all the way with Baal. And the, and the sages question, well, why would a prophet of God even suggest to Jews go all the way with Baal? Well, he knows that the fundamental problem is that they think there's a little bit of light here and a little bit of light there. And that by advocating them to leave God and go all the way, they will come to see that that is truly a dead end and that they will return with sincerity to God. And a dead end is probably the right phrase. It, it literally, it will end in death. It will, it, it will be destructive, but a person, the person could experience destructiveness a kind of destruction that's less than death, and they have a chance to, with a physical life, you know, return. And anyway, that's the general uh, machin. What do you there. think, what effect do you think it's going to have on society now that same-sex marriage is basically accepted by the majority of the population as equally valid? Well, I, I wouldn't concede that the, that the majority of the population accepts it. I understand that the majority of the media accepts it, yeah. and that, and that uh, I think, I don't uh, certainly the majority of popular elections have always rejected it, and it's been backdoor uh, politics by judges overruling the results of elections that have manifested in most of it. There may be some exceptions I'm not aware of. Um, but uh, obviously it's a terrible thing. In fact, the Midrash is explicit that the, the, the flood, the first destruction of the world, this was uh, the final last straw in which it's not enough. It's bad enough that there would be some people who would engage in a public ex, uh, in, in homosexual acts. God can let that go. He's really saying. But if everyone say approves of it, like in a marriage, mm -hmm. that's when I say you're all done. Now God's promise not to destroy the world. Uh, we're, again, these are fine with me. People take these as metaphorical analogies or yeah. as literal truth. It, it works the same way. Yeah. Um, the uh, the bottom line is it's common it's it's commented upon in the Torah, the, the writings in which say this is a bad sign for man if it comes to be where really the majority actually does accept it, but I don't know that that's uh, that hasn't happened yet and I'm I'm not convinced it will happen but it's certainly if you're asking uh, well what would I think I'm sure that would be bad yeah. you know so let's hope that doesn't happen yeah. It's kind of absurd. I mean, what do you, what, what, what does it mean? It's like somebody deciding uh, to proclaim it, 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 changing words. I, I made a joke with my children on, uh, to make an analogy. Let's just say, what if some state of California were to pass a law that uh, that now you have been certified as a chipmunk, yeah. you know, and now for therefore you are one. Yeah. You know, it doesn't change the reality. Whatever a given government might proclaim, there's a a God-ordained reality. Men and women are different. Now, and by the way, if people don't notice that, um, they're kind of idiots. I mean, yeah. let's go. <laughs> and I don't think there's even the most uh, liberal person I know isn't that kind of an idiot. Everybody really knows. Who are they kidding? It's just like the elephant in the room. Nobody wants to talk about. Yes, we all know that men and women are completely different, uh, and. Uh, that's not to say they're not completely equal, but they're completely different. Yeah. Anybody can't absorb that. It's like saying which is taller, a giraffe or a mouse. I mean, come on, yeah. we don't have to wait for the, the measuring tape to come out. We, we can, uh, with our own limited experience, we can uh, make a hash bond. Yes, uh, yes. and uh, so let's, let's wrap up by telling people again about your, your concert. You've got uh, com one coming up May 1st. 2013, 8 p.m. Cap Studio, 13752 Ventura Boulevard, Sherman Oaks. That's right. CAP is called the Complete Actors um, Place. Complete Actors Place. It's owned by my friend Lonnie Stevens and his uh, partner Alex. It's a cool place, so I, it's worth uh, going in it uh, for whatever thing they're going on. But I particularly hope that people come down and see what we're doing. I'm very proud of this material. I'm very proud of of uh, my son. And, uh, and I'm working with a, a couple of the best uh, musicians in the world, Gary Denton and uh, Sinclair Watt. And uh, check it out.
Okay, great. Thanks a lot, Rick. Great to talk to you. God bless.